Hi Ed, thanks for joining us this morning. Hello, I'm very happy to be here doing something productive. Ed, we're going to ask you some questions from Speakers for Schools and then we'll move on to the student Q&A. Cool, good stuff. So firstly, please could you tell us about your career journey and how it's led you to your current role? Well, yeah, well it started here, sort of. <laughs> so that's me when I was 12 years old. And um, did you, you said there's a school from Littlehampton watching this? Yeah. I'm from Littlehampton. So, well, Rustington, actually. Well, actually, the East Preston Rustington border. Um, so, I actually started doing uh, a lot of uh, what they used to call AMDRAM, amateur dramatics, at the Windmill Theatre in Littlehampton, just down by the seaside. So, I was in Bugsy Malone, Sound of Music, all the classic stuff. And, uh, and I loved that. And then I got, because I love drama so much. They were, I, I actually ended up going to a boarding school where they had a really good theatre because I got a drama scholarship. So I got my fees paid for me and uh, and then I got to do a lot of stuff in their theatre. And then from that, I, I got placed in the National Youth Theatre, which I completely squandered and didn't really put enough work in. And then I, uh, then I went to university at Goldsmiths and I studied uh, the rather grandly titled Drama and Theatre Arts. And um, then I lost my nerve a little bit and decided maybe I really wanted to work in TV, but it seemed very daunting in those days. So I got a job behind the camera for a bit. I was a researcher and a runner in TV, but I started doing a bit of stand up comedy on the side. And uh, from that, I sort of accidentally fell into being a children's TV presenter. I uh, got a, well, was sent for an audition at Nickelodeon, uh, which was uh, the sort of the biggest satellite kids channel at the time. And I nearly didn't go along because I was doing lots of stand up comedy gigs at the time for um, basically drunk people in pubs. So I didn't really understand why my agent was sending me along to, to do a children's thing. So but I went along and maybe I just exuded a lot of confidence because I kind of didn't really understand why I was there. But they gave me the job anyway, and I absolutely loved it and just was having the time of my life and couldn't really imagine a better way of working and getting paid for it. Uh, so that was in 2000 and we went on air 2005, worked there for three years and then I got poached by CBBC uh, and started presenting TV with a cactus, talking cactus, who I've got down here actually. Uh, there he is. So this was a, uh, this was Outcho the cactus. I'm not the puppeteer so I can't do the voice but he used to speak, uh, used to speak Cactinian. You'd go, hello and um, he used to come on. Um, we used to come on between the programs. What's called presentation. So you link, you link into the program and say what's coming up next. That sort of thing. Is that is that enough to get you to uh, where I am now? Or I'll, I've got another ten years after that. But that's great. Thanks, Ed. So we would like to know uh, about some of your experiences and what it's like to work in television. Um. Well, there's not a lot of work at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> working in television at the moment is a lot of me sitting in my house going like this. Um, uh, it is, I mean, it's the most fun I can imagine having. It fits all the things that I enjoy very well. Um, it is very insecure, so you have to be prepared for a low level of anxiety constantly about where your next job is coming from. Uh, and I've been virtually continually employed uh, yeah, since 2005, so that's 16 years. And and uh, I met when I so I met my wife in 2008, and then when the pandemic started, I was going oh, a bit worried about work. You know, oh, I don't know where my next job's coming from. And she went, well, there's no change there. You've been whinging on about this ever since I met you. So, <laughs> and basically, all the time you were like, where's my next job coming from? Where's my next job coming from? Um, so if you want a uh, <laughs> I'm surprised I ever got employed actually. This is my student ID photo by the way they're just showing now. So um, uh, yeah as you can see I applied myself very well at university and took it very seriously. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah so don't go into TV if you are looking for uh, a laid-back life. Uh, you will be constantly on the edge of your seat all the time. Uh, but the payoff is that it's it's different all the time. So you're meeting different people all the time. Uh, I work a lot on location, so I'm, I film all around the country and then all around the world. Um, there's not many jobs where you get to do that. Uh, oh, this is my um, this is my first Edinburgh show, by the way, that I did. 
uh, in 2003 with some people you've probably never heard of, like Greg Davies from Taskmaster and Rob Gilbert off the telly. Um, but yeah, that we all started. We did a we did a month long show in a basement of a bar, and you could only fit about thirty five people in. Uh, and it was how much was it? Eight pound fifty a ticket. Yeah, you couldn't see Greg Davis for eight pound fifty a ticket now. Um, sorry, I've gone off on a tangent there because I got distracted by a picture of my own face. Uh, <laughs> what was the other thing you wanted to know about some of your experiences of working in television? Uh, oh yes, they're all great. Next, no. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I, 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 annoyingly, this the smartphone was only invented uh, in what was it, two thousand eight, something like that. When I was at Nickelodeon, I was constantly meeting really famous people because they used to send me down to Leicester Square and I had to stand outside the films, interviewing people as they went in at the premieres. So I met all the like big celebrities at the time. And uh, it was all recorded on what's called DigiBeta to be shown on TV. None of it was put on the internet and I didn't have a smartphone. So I've got no evidence at all, <laughs> or very little evidence of the fact that I met people like Tom Cruise, Bruce Willis, Patrick Stewart out of Star Trek, Jim Carrey, all these people. Um, I mean, it was amazing. And some of them uh, just wanted to go back to their hotel room as quickly as possible and couldn't give you, could barely give you the time of day. Others were so friendly and helpful and like Tom Cruise, I won't hear a bad word against Tom Cruise because I got Tom Cruise to burp into a jar and then we auctioned it off on TV and that was on my showreel. Uh, so in TV you have a little thing called a showreel, you put all your favourite bits on, just about three minutes long you send it to producers and things. That was the top of my showreel for about 10 years was me getting to Tom Cruise to burp into a jar. I love you Tom Cruise! I'm sure you're watching this in this Lampton and Sheffield. Um, so that was very exciting. And I got to go to LA as well to the Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards. And and when I grew up I'm, as a kid, I was just obsessed with Hollywood and wanted to go to Hollywood. And so I was I was actually in Hollywood, getting paid to be in Hollywood. It was brilliant. Uh, so that was a real highlight for I started at CBBC. And and then a real a real highlight starting at CBBC was getting to do the presentation between the programmes, because when I was growing, when I when I was growing up, we only had four channels. Uh, so, and, and in the afternoons from about 3.30 till 5.30, you had the children's programmes. So you'd rush home from school. There was a very limited selection of stuff. And also a lot of a lot of adults ended up watching kids TV, like a builder would come home or something and he'd just flick on BBC One, it'd be on in the background. So everybody knew who Philip Schofield was and his go talking gopher, Gordon the gopher and Andy Crane, who had Ed the Duck, his puppet. So I found myself on TV with a puppet. As far as I was concerned, life didn't get any better than that. Uh, I was in paradise for two or three years when I was doing that. I absolutely loved it. Um, but it did get a little bit claustrophobic being in the same studio every single day, five days a week. Um, and then they, they moved CBBC up to Salford up north and I wanted to stay in London. So then they started giving me jobs going around the country. So I started doing a show called All Over the Place, um, which was started off in the UK. And then we the third year we went around America. We did 18 states around America, just kind of look at weird, wacky things. Then the next series we went to Australia and I lived out there for nearly four months. And then uh, that's me doing stand up, by the way. <laughs> oh, and that's uh, that was one of the first professional jobs I got after that was a uh, Glastonbury. Uh, that was quite a highlight. Um, yeah, then I did two series in Europe and two in Asia, and then we finished off with another two in the UK. So it was 10 years of telly I did making that show. Um, uh, now there's a pandemic, so it, it wouldn't be all over the place. It would be all over my house. <laughs> this episode, we're having a look around my sitting room. What's in here? Um, and then the other big, the other big, uh, big highlight for me is was um, marrying mum and dad, which is where kids organise their parents' weddings, um, which has become a huge, a much bigger part of my life than I ever thought it would be because I fell in love with the wedding ceremonies. I really started to enjoy hearing about the people's lives and getting all emotional. Um, so I actually started it up as a little side hustle two years ago. Um, I'm. I'm now a trained wedding celebrant, which is not something I ever thought I would be. <laughs> and I conduct wedding ceremonies in my spare time. 
because I thought it was such a lovely thing to do. Um, so you never know where TV is going to take you. And uh, look, I never knew it was going to take me to this picture you're looking at here. So that was when I was still doing quite a lot of stand up for grown ups. And, uh, and then every day, oh no, three days a week actually, because we used to pre-record. We were three days live, two days pre-recorded. We used to go to this studio and uh, slide down a slide and throw custard at each other. Uh, sorry, I got distracted again by uh, all these pictures in the past. Anyway, is that enough highlights and experience for you, Charlotte? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Next, we'd like to know about some of the main skills that you've needed for your role and how the young people listening can develop these skills. Uh, well, I mean, a big a big skill when you are a presenter is presenting. <laughs> so I would say you've never been in a better position. Well, you've never been in a worse position in terms of competition because everyone's doing it. But you've never been in a better comp position to have a crack at it because it's it's so easy now. You can just use your phone or borrow your parents phone if you haven't got one. Get on TikTok or YouTube, Snapchat, your social of choice and be a presenter every day if you want. Um, so the quality of people, it used to be that you would employ a person like me because I'd been on stage quite a lot. I was comfortable showing off. I looked more comfortable. I was still probably look quite nervous, but I'd look more comfortable in front of a camera than most people. Because, um, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, when someone got a camera out or a video camera, it was like, oh! A witch, a witch. Everyone, everyone would stand there doing their photo face. Cheese, like that. You know, everyone's so natural now in front of the camera. Every, everybody is like a presenter. So you can you can really get those get those skills really, really honed and um, and just produce your own content as well. And and there's, and there's it's so easy to get your hands on a, a cheap microphone. If uh, you know, if you want to upgrade a bit to uh, using a slightly better camera you, know, you can make some amazing looking stuff that looks better than any of the tv that was going out 20 years ago um but then also things you can do at school uh a lot of i mean my even my school wasn't my school wasn't posh enough to have like a debating society but i've heard people who people who get into debating that is an amazing thing to do um and not not just for presenting but for your whole life you know you're learning how to win arguments <laughs> um and you know sell something to people you know it's, it's d debating is so good for sales presentation all sorts of stuff you know my, my wife is a social researcher and i hadn't realized she's you know she's working at home now and she's doing like three or four presentations i didn't realize she is a presenter basically she's up, up in the study giving presentations with less preparation than i would expect for what i do i'd be more nervous than she is um, so yeah anything that gets you out in front of people uh, and it's really, really embarrassing and horrible when you start doing it. Um, and that's why you just have to keep on doing it as much as possible. Um, and you you feel like because you because you see people who are so confident doing it, you feel like such a loser when you start and you're all nervous and, and you're anxious and things are getting all jumbled up in your head. And you, you just have to believe that if you keep practicing and you keep failing, uh, you will get better. So you just have to embrace that failure. Um, oh, look, picture me in a top hat. That was <laughs> that was actually my first CBBC show. Uh, so when I was still at Nickelodeon, I annoyed Nickelodeon because I went off to CBBC and filmed a series of this thing called Wonderful World of Weird. Um, and uh, yeah, and the only reason I got the job at CBBC actually was I sent them a, a video of what I'd been doing at Nickelodeon. So yeah, it's important to sell yourself. Anyway, I found myself in the same studio where they filmed the Muppet show, which I used to watch as a as a kid. So just to the just to the left of me was the um the balcony where the two old Muppets used to shout insults at the other Muppets. Uh, yeah, I was dead excited to be there. That was very exciting. Uh, yeah, so what uh, advice? Advice what other things. Make sure you stay in contact with people, I would say. Um, because everyone, when when you're thinking about uh, how to get on in something like TV, you're always you're always thinking about the people you're meeting, how to network, you know, make new contacts. Sometimes it's easy just to to forget that you've made loads of contacts already, and uh, I've made the mistake sometimes of there being like there was a guy, a friend of mine at uni, he was a great mate of mine, 
I sort of lost contact with him after a year or two. I looked him up on Facebook the other day and he works in radio now. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> he's a really good contact. And he was one of my best friends. Um, and I just kind of let him slip. So, uh, yeah, just just kind of um, keep being aware of. Just try and try and have as big a network as you can and um, be aware that everyone everyone could scratch your back at some point in the future. Is that helpful? Yeah, thanks for that advice, right. Ed. We, next, we would like to know how children's television is different from presenting to an adult audience. Well, I think one of the secrets of good kids TV is it's not that different, actually. And uh, it's funny, actually, a lot, a, lot, a lot of people who make adult TV, they get very scared about doing the kids stuff. and. And particularly the presenters, they can start talking like this. Hello, hello. <laughs> Are you all right? Do you need help? It's like just they're just people. Just talk to them like people, they're just normal people, children. Um, I mean, the the one thing, something, a reason I think I fell into this job so well was at school. My teachers used to say that I was good at what they called pracy. So, which was basically, I was quite good at reading a book or whatever and then writing a page about it and getting all the main points down and that's basically what you're doing is you're you're trying to strip out anything superfluous and just give the kids the the basic points don't talk down to them but give it to people crisp concise make it really clear to understand um yeah i mean uh, an another thing that adults get worry about is using words the children won't understand oh will they understand that kind of not realizing that kids hear words they don't understand all the time so um, again don't don't overload it with with words they won't understand but don't be afraid of 20 percent of it going over their head um and another reason why kids tv isn't actually all that different to the, the age group i'm talking about by the way is more like uh seven to eight year olds to 13 14 year olds for the for the really little ones it's different um, but yeah, another reason it's not all that different is that very often people are going to be watching it with their older brothers and sisters, maybe even their parents. So quite often we chuck in stuff for them as well because they might be in charge of the remote control. <laughs> so you want to keep them watching too. So we would, you know, we'd make jokes about celebrities who were around at the time or stuff from the past that the kids wouldn't remember, but we know the mums and dads would find it funny. Um, so yeah, it's not it's not as different as you think. I don't think. Thanks, Ed. And during the pandemic, you're the face of the letters and sounds for department for the Department of Education phonics videos. How else has the pandemic affected your role? Uh, it's affected my role in that I don't have one at the moment because um, <laughs> my TV show got cancelled. We were going to be filming Marry Mum and Dad uh, in last Ju last June, I think we were supposed to start, and then they postponed it till February, and uh, and now it's postponed until who knows when because it's very you can't film weddings and getting whole families together and old people and all that stuff. Um, so yeah and then, and then all my stuff has been location for as i said for the, like, the last 10 years so it's been really weird uh, trying to learn how to do stuff from my bedroom uh, i've got involved in some online comedy gigs i did those phonics videos which was quite nice to sort of help out uh but uh, yeah for my my industry i mean a lot of my friends have actually given up i've got a, i've got somebody who i used to present with and they are now planning on being a florist uh, which is probably a good profession to go into because there will be a lot of weddings after these lockdowns so I'm hoping I'm going to get lots of bookings for them uh, yeah no it's been really really tough uh, especially like I was doing a panto uh, last year well the panto I did two years ago uh, some of those people have now given up and they've become teaching assistants or working in shops because there's just been no work for for people who do you know work in live and I was I was quite lucky because I've worked in TV so I've managed to save a bit of money over the years but I was working with somebody she's a West End star she's been 
in working constantly in the West End ever since she left drama school for about 10 years. She's been in lots of big West End shows and uh, yeah, she's now a teaching assistant in Peckham. Um, yeah, it's been really tough for people, really tough. And then, and then other people, like, as I said, my wife's a social researcher, she's busier than ever. So it's a, it's a really strange time. Thanks, Ed. We've had some questions come in from the students and the schools, so I'm going to ask you a few of them just so we've, we've got time to ask everyone's questions. So we've had um, questions come in from Miss Gibbs, Year 8 class at the Copley Academy. They would like to know a bit more about your early acting experiences. Ah, right, well. So when uh, my my dad doesn't like spending money and my mum wanted a piano so she tried to, when I was six years old she tried to manipulate me into getting piano lessons so that my dad would buy her a piano and apparently I dug my heels in and I was absolutely adamant that I didn't want piano lessons I wanted acting lessons <laughs> and I don't, I don't know how I heard about acting lessons at the age of six but so my mum relented and used to take me to stand in the sitting room of this uh, man called Michael Edgeley who and that I would like learn monologues and things and then I'd go and do like drama exams and drama festivals where I'd perform monologues in front of people at the age of six or seven. He's really weird. Um, and he was an amazing guy and he used to run the um, the drama clubs at the Windmill Theatre in Littlehampton. So when I was eight years old I started doing performances and shows there and it was just I just found it the most thrilling exciting thing getting in front of a live audience uh, and getting that reaction when you're in the rehearsal room and you try some things out and you think it's going to be funny or entertaining and then you, you 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 put it on and those first few shows when you get that reaction and I still get it now when I do panto or something and you land that gag for the first time and a thousand people all suddenly start laughing. It's such a good feeling to to make people happy like that. Um, and yeah, I just uh, as a as a kid, that feeling of just creating a little separate magical world for people, a little bit of escapism. It was so addictive. Uh, yeah, so I did that for a number of years till I was about twelve. And yeah, then I said quite then quite a lot of school productions. Uh, and then I noticed there was a thing called the National Youth Theatre in London, which sounded quite exciting. And because I was used to auditioning and doing monologues and things, they could they did productions at the Bloomsbury Theatre, which sounded quite posh up near Euston. I quite like the idea of doing something there. So I went up at the age of 14 with my mum and did an audition for that. And I got a place. I still put it on my CV now because it's quite famous, actually, the National Youth Theatre. And I did the training course with them that summer which was a good laugh. And, uh, and then I was just really lazy and I didn't bother auditioning. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, teenagers do that sometimes. You have a, you have a hobby that you're like, really into. And uh, then I think I was just sitting around playing video games with my mates for four or five years. And uh, let's, let uh, some great opportunities like that just slide by that I really kick myself for now. So don't do that. Stay in contact with your hobbies. You can still play Mario Kart, just don't play it six hours a day. Um, uh, yeah, and then I and then because of that, I kind of lost my confidence a bit and lost the bug. So when I was studying drama at university, I didn't do an awful lot of acting. Actually, I did a I, I sort of tried different things, lighting, sound, all that stuff. But I started to realise it was the acting that I loved most of all, and that was why when I started working in TV in the office, we'd go out filming, and there might be a presenter or a comedian or whatever that we were filming, and I'd just be behind the camera thinking, "Oh, I want your job." which is why I started doing stand up, which was a very good way of getting out in front of a live audience. Um, it's like boot camp, really, because after about three or four gigs when you've never done stand up before, uh, that's about as bad as it's ever going to get in life, really. <laughs> Just I've had rooms full of people shouting taxi, wanting me to get off because I was so bad. Um, so then after that, whenever I was performing after that, I think, well, at least it's not I'm not starting out in stand up again. Uh, so things can only get better from there. But that's what I mean about embracing failure. You've just got to keep on being rubbish until you're not rubbish anymore. 
Miss Gibbs class would also like to know about your experiences in school and if some of the experiences have helped you in your career today and if there are any opportunities that you grabbed whilst you're in school. Ooh. Uh, yeah, well, anything going on in the drama club, I was I was in straight away, whatever it was. I was even because I, I was in I was in too much stuff, really. And the drama teacher said to me, I, I, I'm not putting you I'm not giving you a main part in this again. And I said, oh, I'll do anything. So I was the do, pulling the curtains. <laughs> so I, I had a, I had a drama scholarship that was paying for me to go to this school, but I'm just in the in the wings, just like pulling the ropes uh, and loving it. Like it's so it's just such good fun to be part of a team because that's that's another thing I, I think I love about this job. And uh, and even stand up where you're on stage on your own, you're still in part of a team because you're backstage before and after. You're quite often driving together in the car to the gig. Uh, some of those people like Greg Davies I was talking about, they're still really good mates of mine now because we shared, you know, a lot of time together. Um, so yeah, that, uh, you'll have a lot of fun getting involved in any sort of performance at school. That's always good. Uh, yeah, like I said, if you ever, it was not something I ever did, but I really regret if you ever hear about a debating society or debating club, or if there's even there's like a on, on maybe they do them online now with Zoom and stuff. I really recommend getting into it because also particularly if you're wanting to get into presenting you you do need or it does help to have an inquiring mind so you know be interested in the world interested in issues because you're going to meet all sorts of different people and you need that connection when you're interviewing somebody um, you need to know how to pull all the most interesting stuff out of them and it helps if you're interested and you're just interested in stuff around you so try to have a broad range of things you're interested in at school don't just get stuck in a, a rut and just go like oh I'm I just do football or I just do history or whatever it is you know um you'll you'll probably find you're a bit too a bit too limited but at the same time completely contradicting myself uh also be aware that this is the age of being a specialist so uh things like YouTube and stuff like that uh, what what tends to pull people towards your channel is if you're very very specialized in one little thing that gives people a reason to come to you so try and have an inquiring mind be open to lots of different things but at the same time be really good at knowing what's unique about you and your interests and what will draw people to you thanks ed we're now going to move on to some questions from sheffield park academy and this question i know you've got a great answer to they would like to know if you could go back in time to your younger self or your 16 year old self, what piece of ad advice would you give to yourself? <laughs> um, don't don't wear those baggy trousers because they're really impractical in the rain. They just soak all the water up. Uh, that would be the first thing to say. Uh, I mean, I'm a big I'm when I when I do these because I, I have done these, as you probably know, I have done these speakers for schools things quite a lot going around different schools around London and something I always say to people is the embracing failure like I was too much of a perfectionist I used to worry about things being perfect and as a result I would procrastinate and quite often not get around to doing them at all or do them in the end badly because I'd run out of time uh, don't worry about being things being perfect just have a go and you won't learn anything if you're not prepared to take a risk and accept failure. And uh, and, I was, and I was a big fan of saying to people, failure is the way you learn. But uh, I was doing some acting classes at the beginning of the year and the acting teacher said, no, that's not true. Success is the best way to learn. <laughs> is it, but you, you do learn from failure, but actually you learn more from your successes. I was like, oh yeah, you're right, actually. So I shouldn't probably shouldn't have been going around saying to all the children around the country, fail, fail, keep on failing. No, you know, obviously try and succeed as well. But you'll always have at least one because <laughs> my acting teacher said the only thing you learn from failure is don't do that again. Um, but that's still a really valuable thing to learn, I think. So don't be scared of failure. Um, what is it? Stay in contact with people. Oh, and actually another another bit of advice I would give to myself because it would do it would so help me now if I had this mindset and it's very hard to break myself out of it but do the do the difficult thing first so if you get up in the morning and you have a difficult thing like and with me it's line learning so I get up in the morning and I have a song to learn 
for kids show I'm doing uh, or some, I've got to read up on the background of somebody I'm interviewing or I've got some lines to learn for a kids comedy sketch I'm going to do first thing I should do in the morning because I've got that hanging over me I should do that and I should get that absolutely down and then I've got the rest of the day to play with and do the the less pressing things the less fun things and and I always fall into the trap of just putting it to the side for a little bit and uh, and then we're about to go live on TV in half an hour and you're like oh luckily I'm I've got quite good now at learning lines quickly but your your life is so much easier just do the difficult thing first and if I'd known that if I if I'd learned how to do that with my revision and stuff like that at school uh life would have been a lot easier but I got into some bad habits I think um so yeah do do the difficult thing first. Give you a little, give yourself a little treat every half hour for sticking at it, but get it out of the way, and then the rest of your day will be so much better, and you won't be all anxious and beating yourself up. I think that's really good advice, even if I do say so myself. Oh, this is Hi. me with uh, the voice of Love Island now, Ian Sterling, who uh, used to present with Hacker the Dog, and yeah, somehow when he was on all over the place, it always ends up me being in the stupid costumes and him very rarely in them. So that's him. Mocking me as usual. Thanks, Ed. I, I did get him to dress up as Shakespeare's wife once, though, which he's still angry about. And I also think that is a great advice that you gave. And I do think that there is so much to learn from failure, um, even if it is just building your resilience, definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's me doing panto, which is one of my favourite favorite things actually because it reminds me of being back in Littlehampton in the at the Windmill Theatre so I, I always look forward to Panto it's always my favorite job of the year and I get to throw sweets at people but I did I did one this year in Poole uh, in Dorset uh, we did a did a two-week Panto with social distancing and everything and uh, a day in we all caught coronavirus which took me a month to recover from <laughs> So didn't enjoy that panto quite so much. Anyway, so have you got any other questions? Yeah, we've got loads of illnesses coming. and ailments. <laughs> um, the students have asked, did you always want to do this job when you were younger or was there anything else that you would have considered? I can't remember wanting to do anything else. So I remember, uh, I, have, I have a really early memory of being behind the shed in my parents' garden and pretending to present TV shows <laughs> and I even had my own show and I don't know why I had a catchphrase so the show I, I developed in my head was called number one and my catchphrase was number one check for fun um, I don't I don't know what it was or why I said that um, so yeah th th that's actually one of my first memories it was me wanting to be a TV presenter but it, it seemed such a ridiculous thing that you didn't really go around saying that to people because it just sounded stupid um, I would say that I wanted to be an actor, but that was because that seemed a bit more accessible because you could you could you had the you had local theatres you could imagine doing that. But the idea of being on the TV just seemed you know ridiculous. Um, and it pro probably feels a bit less ridiculous now, like I said, because now everyone can be on the TV, uh, on a phone or a laptop or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't ever want, I don't think I ever wanted to be anything else. Always wanted to be some sort of performer, a show off basically. Next, the students would like to know about some of the challenges you faced in your career and what you've learned from them. Oh, that's a good one. Um, challenges. Well, I think one of the one of the challenges is learning not to uh feel bad about other people's successes it's it's quite easy when you when you're st especially when you're starting out like that edinburgh show for example that i did um so we had a really we did an edinburgh i did an edinburgh show with greg and rod and steve it went really well we all got agents um i then sat around for about three months got around to saying to Greg, oh, should we do another Edinburgh show? And he's like, oh, sorry, mate, I don't think you're interested. I'm doing a sketch show now with uh, our friend Marek and Steve, who I was in the show with. I was like, oh, right, oh, okay. So I went off, did my own thing. 
their sketch show was massively successful. And in two years, they were on BBC Three, and I was handing out leaflets in railway stations. Uh, and it was really hard not to <laughs> feel resentful in a way, um, because they were having all this amazing success, and I was like, you know, barely were, were scratching min minimum wage. Um, but then I, got, then I got onto Nickelodeon, and you know, I started following my own path. Um, and then I started to realise that other people's people you know success can actually only be good for you it's so silly to resent people you know being successful because some of their success may rub off on you so much better to work with people who go on to have great success than work with people who don't because that's not going to help you at all so it's actually in your self-interest for people you know to be doing better than you but it kind of goes against that little animal instinct in your brain that's like oh jealous and oh I don't know, it's not fair so you have to ignore that voice and try and be rational about it. Um, and and it and it it did it did work out to be the case because I used to get Greg to come on on my shows on CBBC, uh, and we had a right laugh, and he was brilliant. Um, so uh, yeah, case in point, really, it just it worked out well for me as well. So that's Thanks, your question. Sir. Yeah, I think, and I think it's so important that we don't compare ourselves to others as well. Um, it's oh. such good advice for the students, definitely. Yeah. There's only one you. And, uh, and one day you may be dressed as a frog like that. <laughs> a good skill for our, there we go. <laughs> a good skill for our students is to be able to keep calm under pressure. We would like to know what happens when something doesn't go right when you're live on television and what you do in that situation? Oh, that's another brilliant question. Um, well, one of the first things to remember is you have more time than you think you do. So you can pause for quite a long time in your head. As soon as something goes wrong, you're like, ah, it's going wrong. But you've got three or four seconds to be able to stand to stand on camera looking looking like you know what you're doing trying to work out what to do next that was something i learned in stand up as well if somebody shouted out something someone shouted out you're rubbish or whatever rather than immediately talking back you would pretend not to hear them so you go sorry what was that and it buys you more time so you've always got time uh, also in tv if you're in the studio you've got a little earpiece in your ear uh, which is amazing because you've got the producer director Anybody else who fancies pitching in, giving you advice in your ear. So like uh, my friends Dick and Dom, who uh, have been on Kids TV for eons, they used to work with an amazing producer called Steve Ride, who used to be a presenter himself on CITV back in the 90s. So one of the reasons their shows were so funny was Steve is a really funny guy. <laughs> He'd just be feed feeding them stuff to say. Um, so you've got those people helping you as well. Uh, and also what people really appreciate when something goes wrong is just fessing up and admitting that something's gone wrong because very often people can see it. So like one of the big things people worry about on kids TV unnecessarily really is, you know, somebody swearing. Oh, my God, what if somebody swears? And it's never and it's never actually happened to me. But what you're taught and what I was prepared to do if somebody did swear is you just look at the camera and go, oh, I'm I'm sorry about that. You shouldn't have heard that. And then you carry on, you know, it's no big deal. Um, so, yeah, you just have to you just have to try to not get stressed. Um, easier said than done, I know. But, yeah, very often the best thing to do when something goes wrong is just point it out and talk about it. Oh, see, I said I went to Hollywood. Proof. Photographic proof. Next, we've got. Some questions come in from the year eights and year sevens from the North Birmingham Academy. They would like to know, and it's a similar question to the one we've just asked you, uh, what has been your mo most awkward moment in television? Oh, most awkward moment. Uh, God, I've been quite lucky, you know, I haven't had that many really awful moments. Oh, I did have a, so I remember, yeah, when I was, my, the first series of All Over the Place we did, at the end of All Over the Place, every episode we used to do an event. So uh, I did like 
people do just the craziest things all over the world. So like there was a toilet racing competition in Australia that I took part in just as Jeremy Clarkson and we wrote plop gear on the side of the toilet. Uh, yeah, we there was a cow pat throwing competition in Wisconsin in America where they used to like throw dried cow pats out of a giant cow and the furthest one like a frisbee, they got a prize. Just endless weird competitions. But so this was the second event we'd ever done in the first series. We went to the air, this actually exists, the Air Guitar Championships in London. People came from all over the world to play air guitar. And so I'd got a little, I'd, I, put, I put a little routine together. I turned up dressed as Slash from Guns N' Roses. Um, feeling quite pleased with myself, thinking I was going to do really well. And they just hated me. And um, and it, and because it was a new series, and I was just getting my feet under the table. Uh, and I hadn't been doing so much stand up for the last two or three years. And I, swear, I guess I'd been getting a little bit cocky about me being all right at this job now. And they just tore strips off me. The crowd hated me. And uh, so, and you knew it was being filmed, and everyone was going to watch it. Uh, luckily, the, they were quite sympathetic to me in the edit, and they didn't make me look too bad. But that was pretty humiliating. Everyone, a whole room full of people, just screaming, "You're rubbish!" And my girlfriend turned up to watch as well. I felt really silly. <laughs> Next, so, yeah, that's, that's probably the worst one. Next, the students would like to know, has it been quite hard to get into the TV and entertainment industry? Hmm. Well, I was very lucky. I had a, I had, I had a lucky break. But then I've, then I've also heard people say that when you start putting the work in, then the, then the luck magically appears, you know. So looking back on it, you know, I'd spent years performing, interested in the industry, learning about it. I went to university. Then I happened to go on holiday with a mate of my girlfriend who had was working at a TV company and he was he was like the office runner. So he was the guy who was like filling the photocopier, pouring out the coffee and everything. And he was leaving that job and he's and he but he and he knew because he knew my background and I talked about acting and drama and stuff a lot he knew that that might be a good job for me so he put a word in for me um and lo a lot of people have a story like that um but increasingly these days the best the best way to get noticed is to start making your own like i said start making your own stuff and just putting those hours in yourself uh, and you can do it all from your bedroom and you just keep pumping it out find names of people on credits for TV shows or go on IMDB, find out who these people are and just keep hounding them. And if you're doing reasonably good stuff and you can send them some interesting links and you, you keep on at them and you message them every three months and there's like 50 people you contact and you just make it a little thing you do. You set a few, set an hour or two aside a week to be that person who's pestering everybody. You'll be amazed at the results you get back. And uh, and I'm a total hypocrite because I'm saying stuff that I should be doing myself as well. And I uh, very often don't. <laughs> you should be doing that throughout your entire career. Just just gently pestering people all the time. So I went off on a little bit of a tangent there, but uh, that's how you can get into TV as well. Thanks, Ed. And the students first, out of acting and presenting, do you have one that you prefer? And if you do, why? uh well it's sort of changed over the years actually so to begin with it was acting and then when i got into comedy started to enjoy the presenting so when i was doing stand-up i'd kind of developed i mean to me presenting is still acting so when i'm presenting i'm playing the part of somebody who is confident presenting <laughs> yeah because in my daily life i can be quite shy so um so in a way it was still acting i suppose but I start to enjoy the presenting more. And then now, weirdly, the last couple of years, I've started to get more into the idea of acting again. Um, and I don't know whether that's maybe also as I'm getting older, like I've got kids now, I'm in my early 40s. I guess I'm starting to think more about where future work might come from. And I'm like, you can look more of a state as an actor as you get older than you can as a presenter. 
<laughs> the presenter you kind of generally have to be nice and more nicely turned out more worried about your appearance um you know you can play the part of like some old guy in a park when you're 50. um Oh yeah, so that was, uh, if you're okay, if in case you're wondering what those photos were, that was me on the Great Wall of China with my friend Naomi, who I, who I do marry mum dad with when we were filming all over the place. That was a career highlight of mine, dancing on the Great Wall of China, dressed as a Mongol. And this is one I put in just to show off. It's me with Prince Harry. <laughs> I told him to get, get out of the UK. I said, this country is no good for you anymore, Harry. Get yourself an American wife and Get over that side of the pond. That's where the future is, I said to him. How how did you meet Prince Harry? Were you on a, a filming a TV show at the time? Well, he wanted to meet me, actually. So I, eventually I relented and said, oh, go on then. Now, this was uh, so this, this is an example of like one of the some of the nice little jobs you can pick up. So uh, they for the premiere of Paddington 2, they did a big charity event where they got lots of kids who had won competitions at school but also a lot of kids from sort of deprived backgrounds and things or kids who'd been struggling through great adversity like kids with operations and things and they filled the whole of the Orient Express which is this really posh train full of all these kids and then the royal family came on so they had different royals in every carriage so Harry did a couple of carriages Prince William did a couple of carriages Kate did some I think Meghan was there um, yes, yeah, so I was just, and then the, then the Orient Express took off around London for a bit and uh, they had all these like posh waiters serving the kids all this posh food and um, yeah, and I was just like rocking around with Prince Harry <laughs> and uh, he was a really good bloke. He was like getting loads of selfies and pulling funny faces and yeah, I got on with him quite well. <laughs> And we've got time for a couple more questions. Ooh. I think we might know the answer to this one, uh, but the students have asked, what was your favourite subject at school and why? Um, well, we, I don't think I had a favourite. So one of my problems I've always had is I can't settle on anything. Like I said, with my drama degree, I couldn't decide whether it was like acting or directing or sound or lighting I, I couldn't decide so when I was at school I couldn't I couldn't decide if my favorite subject was theatre studies or history or art or English or classics <laughs> like I found them all equally interesting um, and some for, for a while I thought maybe actually when you talk about professions I did think for a while maybe I could be a history teacher when I was trying to think of like a more sensible job that wouldn't be quite so nerve-wracking where you could have like a regular wage and know where you're going to work every day. The idea of sort of telling stories from history, I found quite interesting. Um, so I looked for a, a history and drama degree because you could get English and drama as a degree. I looked for history and drama and it didn't exist. Um, maybe they do now, I don't know, but they didn't then. So I would have, I would have done a history and drama degree. And, and it's, it's a very important thing to know about as an actor, actually, because if you're studying Shakespeare or things set in the past, you, you have to do all that research. Um, so if you, you get you have a bit of a head start, if you if you know about your history and your English literature and all that stuff, because that's what you're going to be performing, basically, half the time. Thanks, Ed. And our final question to you. Um, you've already spoken about some of your highlights in working in television. The students would like to know, are there any other career highlights that you would like to tell us about? Oh, um, career highlights. Career highlights. I mean, it, it was quite it was quite a highlight to go back to my school and be one of those people giving a talk at the school. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I felt quite mm, mm, about that. And then they, they put up a picture of me in the corridor afterwards. So uh, I was like, yeah, take that, Mr. So-and-so. Didn't think I'd amount to anything. Uh, so, yeah, that was quite that was quite enjoyable. Um, yeah. Rocking around with Prince Harry was this was a highlight, actually. Um, I presented um, the Children in Need episode of Blue Peter. So I'd grown up as a kid watching Children in Need quite a lot when that was on every year. Uh, and I'd, I'd always been a big Blue Peter watcher. 
Um, I wouldn't say fan because it was a bit, little bit too sensible for me, but it was always on and I always watched it. Um, so, yeah, that was weird to find myself presenting that. Um, oh, and actually there was a there was a there was a brilliant thing that I did, which was they did a, a special broadcast to celebrate 30 years of CBC. And uh, they got every pretty much every single CBBC presenter and puppet in the its studio in Salford outside Manchester. And we did a live broadcast and I got uh, I got Outcho involved and it was so exciting. And I got to hang out with all these like presenters that I grew up watching. Um, and like Andy Crane, who was my presenter that I grew up at the beginning, they were doing a thing in front of the camera with us all waving. And he was like, he was on the edge and not in shot. And I was like, what? We were just about to go live. And I was like, and I was standing in the middle and he was over there. I was like, this is not right. So I ran over, I grabbed him and I shoved him right into the middle of the camera because he was the presenter after Philip Schofield. He was like, he was a legend. I was like, you had to give this man the, the credit he deserved. So yeah, and I got to have a drink with him afterwards. And I was like, this is brilliant. I was living my dream. So uh, yeah, I guess I definitely fell into the right career thinking about how excited I was that, that day. And Ed, before we end the broadcast today, do you have any final comments for the students listening? Oh, uh, <laughs> we'll get through this, everyone. We'll get through this. I mean, you're probably right. You're back at school now, but uh, God, I can't wait to go back to work. Um, no, just uh, keep on trucking. Um, if you are interested. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you're if you're not interested in doing a job like this, um, good on you because there's much more sensible things to be doing. <laughs> I want my kids to be, I want my kids to be doctors or lawyers or something like that. Not this stupid job. Um, so only consider this as a career if you are very, very passionate about it. Otherwise go and do something much more sensible. <laughs> and uh, and it will give your parents a lot less to worry about as well. Because my dad's constantly worrying about whether they have to bail me out one day. But if you do want to do this, um, start now, just, you've you've uh, you've got all the time in the world and I mean I know you haven't you've got homework and all the rest of it but um yeah the earlier you start the the more successful you'll be like I've I've been I didn't get on the tv until I was 26 years old when I got my first presenting job and my friend Kel uh he's young quite a bit younger than me I found myself presenting with him when I was 30 and he was 15 years old <laughs> so <laughs> he got he got a, uh, what is that? 16 year head start on me. Um, so it's uh, it's never too early to start. Thanks, Ed. It's never too early to start. Completely agree. Thank you so much for joining us today and making time to answer all of the students' questions. Thank you for having me.